welcome to Month of Castlevania. It wasn't until one night where my uncle introduced me to Castlevania Symphony of the Night. At first, I didn't think nothing of it. I thought the game looked pretty and the voice acting hilariously entertaining, but it didn't completely pique my interest then. And then my uncle let me borrow the game for a week. Holy shit, I can't believe I missed out on this for so long. We won't get into the origins of the Belmont family until very later in the series, so for the time being, let's just say uh, Dracula borrowed the family's lawnmower and never returned it, so Simon is going on a rampage to teach him a lesson. There's underground caverns, a dungeon of some sort, a clock tower, and finally the grand stairway to Dracula himself. I wonder just what the hell the blueprints looked like when this place was constructed, but if I had to guess, it would probably look something like this. Plastered in just about every wall in the game are candles that Simon can break to collect power-ups such as sub-weapons, or hearts which act as ammunition for your sub-weapons. No, the hearts aren't health. Instead, Simon can restore health by eating pot roast, which can usually be found inside breakable walls and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, we're all thinking why would Simon even consider eating something that came out of a wall, but come on, just look at the thing. It looks fucking delicious. The axe, which can be useful at times, but a little unwieldy other times. The Holy Cross, whoops, I mean the boomerang. Yeah, that's what it was called back in the day. Can't have that pesky religion getting into our video games. Well, to their credit, it does behave like a boomerang and is actually pretty damn useful. But none of these weapons come close to the awesomeness that is the stopwatch and holy water. <laughs> I mean the firebomb. Sorry, religious censorship again. Okay, so you're thinking, well, it seems Simon can get pretty well equipped for his adventure. This game is probably a breeze. No. No. Let me put it bluntly. Castlevania is hard. Fucking hard. One of the most difficult games you'll play on the NES. Now you're probably thinking, well, what causes it to be hard? Is it the enemies, the level design, the controls? All of the above. So close to the exit, a guy, oh God, shit. Oh, oh okay, well that actually, oh fuck. Oh, you motherfucker. Now when I say difficult level design, I'm really talking about those damn stairs. When climbing them, Simon moves like a freaking tank with no way to jump up or off the stairs. Because of this, alongside a restricted whip attack, defending yourself is next to impossible. Go ahead, try and get past the clock tower area without getting hit by those goddamn birds. You just can't. And sometimes, shit like this can happen. What the fuck? Simon has only one type of speed, strutting. The Belmont strut, and he does it so well. My god, the knockback. Upon coming into contact with any hazard, Simon will jump back 5 feet. I'm guessing because it's the first time in his life he's ever felt pain and doesn't know how to properly react to it. Combined with tiny platforms and numerous bottomless pits, you're gonna die plenty of times because of knockback and poor jumping controls. Son of a bitch! Yeah, that's another thing that bothers me. If you collect a sub-weapon while you already have one equipped, it gets replaced, with no way to get the previous weapon back. No amount of words can explain the frustration of losing your triple shot firebomb by collecting the fucking dagger weapon. There's also times where you can get power-ups like the invincibility potion, which makes you invulnerable for a few seconds, and the crucifix, which wipes out all the enemies on the screen. When you see these items, make sure to pick them up. Bam! Awesome. All the names are parodies of famous actors in the horror genre, though frankly, whenever I see the name Mix Strex, I can't help but think of Count Orlock practicing the DJ business. Is Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest better than its sequel in just about every single way? No. If you leave the title running, the game welcomes you to the Hell House, although by looking at the opening scene, I'm pretty sure I'm outside. Seriously, what's with this Hell House? Simon Belmont is once again the star of the game. After whipping the shit out of Dracula in the last game, the Count placed a curse on Simon upon death. So why is the third game subtitle called Dracula's Curse instead of being the subtitle for this game? Simon still struts like nobody's business, has an uncontrollable jump, moves like a tank on stairs, and once again suffers from knockback issues. Ugh, that's gonna happen a lot, especially in this game. Simon still attacks enemies with his trusty whip, which can now be upgraded up to four times by purchasing different whips in towns that Simon can visit assuming you have the hearts to buy them. Yeah, the hearts aren't just ammunition this time, they're now also money. What kind of fucked up country uses ammunition as currency, let alone hearts? So am I to believe that Kano is not only killing his victims, but also stealing their wallet? The only sub-weapons that don't make a return are the axe and stopwatch. The axe I can live without, but I sure would've liked the stopwatch. Well, at least Simon's Quest introduces us to the diamond sub-weapon, which... Hmm. Yeah, I'm already missing the stopwatch. For instance, equipping Dracula's rib lets Simon use a shield to deflect projectiles, and Dracula's heart allows you to reach the third mansion by showing it to the incredibly creepy fairy man. The reason why I say you're wasting time is because for a majority of the game, the townspeople have nothing useful to say. The first guy you meet gives you a nice hint, but as far as memory goes, that's about it. Most of the time, people just tell you the vague whereabouts of clues to Dracula's... 
riddle, and other times they just spur completely useless trivia. Well, hello there, crouching lady, you have any good deals? Well, geez, that's the last time I ever barged into someone's house. The nerve. During the day, you can visit towns and kill enemies with ease. During the night, the towns are closed and the enemies take more hits to kill, and Simon becomes a war hog. I mean, never mind. It takes forever, and even when you get enough hearts, you still have to wait for daylight to arrive. With information from townsfolks that ranges from cryptic to just all around useless, Castlevania 2 is a game where you are pretty much required to read a guide in order to proceed. Whether it's the hints given to you through Nintendo Power or the technological cesspool that is the internet, reading a guide is the only way you'll find out that you need to equip the red crystal, crouch at this dead end, and wait for a whirlwind to warp you to the other side. Or equipping the blue crystal, crouching to this body of water, only to find out that it's not really a body of what? wait, what the hell am I looking at? I can't imagine how first timers were supposed to figure this shit out. It's worse than the original Metroid. Not as bad as Shadowgate though, ugh, that game makes me cringe. Along your journey inside a mansion, you'll come across a cloaked man that can sell you an oak steak. At first, you probably think it's a one-use sub-weapon that does jack all, but in actuality, it's an item you need to use in front of this orb you come across at the end of each mansion. By doing so, you can possess a piece of Dracula. It's never explained why exactly you need an oak steak. I mean, can I just whip the fucking thing and possess a piece that way? Okay, where's the fucking boss fights? I've done about three mansions up to this point and not one boss fight. Oh god, the Grim Reaper! Eat Devo, motherfucker! Wow, that was... Pathetic! Such a downgrade from the last game! Okay, so I got the next piece of Dracula in my possession. Let's move on. Whoa! He responds? What the hell? Wait, I could just strut past him? Both ways? Let me see. Oh my god, I could have just skipped him? Granted, he wasn't a challenge to begin with, but... Wow! Oh, well, Carmilla certainly looks more challenging. That's all she does, isn't it? Although the confrontation between Simon and Dracula has concluded, Simon couldn't survive his fatal wounds at- Wait, wait, what? Simon dies anyway? Actually, depending on how fast you complete the game, you can get one of three endings, with this one considered to be the normal ending. Damn, I couldn't imagine what the bad ending would look like. The battle has consummated. Now peace and serenity have been restored to Transylvania, and the people are free of Dracula's curse forever. And you, Simon Belmont, will always be remembered for your bravery and courage. Oh wait, the bad ending is better than a normal ending, what the shit? The best ending requires you to beat the game in less than 8 game days, but honestly, you're better off just using the game's password feature to get it. By the way, the Famicom version of Simon's Quest is a save feature, yet the NES version does not. May I ask, why? Zelda had a save feature, Final Fantasy had a save feature, I think it would've definitely helped. The plot's simple, kill Dracula. Well, the opening text elaborates a little further with the plot, but it sounds like it was written by a 6 year old. During 15th century Europe, there lived a person named Dracula. He practiced sorcery in order to create a bad world filled with evil. He began taking over the continent of Europe, changing countries from good to bad. The good people of Europe tried to fight off Dracula, but no one was able to survive. Finally, the Belmont family was summoned to battle Dracula's vile forces. The Belmont family has a long history of fighting evil. The townspeople became afraid of the Belmont's superhuman power and asked them to leave the country. Fortunately, the people found a mighty Belmont called Trevor. Wait. They banished the Belmonts because of their power, yet relied on the Belmonts to deal with their problem? Who translated this? Ah, good old pot roast in a wall. It's good to know that every incarnation of Castlevania comes equipped with their own pot roast. Dracula can be quite random. Upon completing certain levels, you are given a choice. Do you take the upper path towards the clock tower, or the lower path through the forest? The choices are yours, and yours alone. First, we have Grant... Dunasty? How do you pronounce that last name? Well, it doesn't really matter because Grant is awesome. Besides being fast and having the ability to crawl on walls and ceilings like a spider, he can also, get this, control his jumps in mid-air! So wait, if the developers are certainly capable of giving a character fluid control, then why the hell aren't they giving the Belmont the proper treatment? But overall, Alucard won't get his badass upgrade until Symphony of the Night, so until then, bleh. I mean, blah. Since Castlevania 3 enhances the formula of the original game, that also means the difficulty has been ramped up to a ridiculous degree. 
this game is hard. Combined with the control issues from earlier and level designs that are just fucking infuriating, Castlevania 3 is a game that not only requires patience, but sheer willpower to avoid throwing your controller straight through your TV. Seriously, some of these levels are just fucking impossible, and if it isn't frustrating gimmicks like awkwardly placed enemies, it's the goddamn stairs! Yes, I know I'm beating a dead horse by mentioning how much I absolutely loathe stairs in the old school games, but is this game where they're the most frustrating? Some levels are filled to the brink with stairs, and combined with enemies that just piss you off, it's aggravating. Incredibly aggravating. What the- that enemy just took a third of my health with one hit! One hit! Why do enemies do more damage in later stages? What's the logic in that? His second form this time around is a group of heads? What the hell is this supposed to be? It looks like a demonic execute. Oh, look at that, a Pokemon reference in a Castlevania game. Hmm. The second form is incredibly easy though, and in a short time, you'll beat the thing no problem. Well, that wasn't so- Whoa, whoa, what the hell? Oh, well, turns out Dracula has a third form this time around. This giant man bird that shoots lasers. Okay, I'm convinced the developers were running out of time and decided to let the child who wrote the opening design the final boss. So, yeah, giant man bird. Once again, you're killing enemies with your trusty whip, the vampire killer. But this time, Simon can whip in eight directions, and it feels good. Oh yeah, this is awesome. Killing airborne enemies has never been this easy, and it feels absolutely great destroying enemies that gave me such a hard time in earlier titles like Axe Knights. Sweet. You can also hold the attack button down and dangle the whip in any direction you want. It looks a bit goofy, but it's great for blocking projectiles and killing annoying enemies like birds. And I love using it against the mummy. Taste my limp whip, vile fiend! Ah, son of a bitch! Knockback is still present though, and just like before, it can lead to some bullshit like this. Simon can now also cling to these hooks that are found in certain levels, allowing him to swing left and right to reach higher areas. It's pretty fun to do, but it becomes a pain in the ass in later levels. Wanna guess why? Once you're finally inside the castle, things start to get a little familiar, although there are still plenty of new elements like swinging chandeliers, a level made of nothing but treasure, and of course, a clock tower. There's always a damn clock tower. The game is nowhere near as difficult as Castlevania 1, and especially not Castlevania 3, but every once in a while, the game loves to remind you that you're playing an old school Castlevania game. Some stages have more than one boss, and sometimes you even fight them in the middle of the stage instead of just at the very end. Only problem is, a lot of them are incredibly easy. I mean, look how fast I kill Medusa here. One of my least favorite bosses in the game is this rock monster, not because of his attacks or anything, it's just because every time you strike him, the screen flashes white and it's incredibly irritating, especially when you're playing on a big TV. Ow, ow, ow. 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 But the boss I hate the most, and the one I never look forward to, is Slogra. Fucking Slogra. Before your encounter with Dracula, you have to fight Slogra, Gaiban, and Death himself with only maybe one or two drumsticks in between each fight. I can take Gaiban down, no problem, but Jesus Christ, this fucking Birdman always gives me the red ass. It's bad enough he has an explosively allergic reaction to Simon's web, but I swear his collision detection is all over the place. Look, I was nowhere near him. What the hell hit me? Come on, I'm so good. God! I hate when that happens. With one final hit, Dracula is once again defeated, and just like the original, Simon watches on as Castlevania crumbles into nothingness, ending Super Castlevania 4. Does anyone else think that body armor is a little too low for comfort? I mean, God forbid there's a sudden draft. Well, in terms of the story, this chick named Elizabeth Bartley wishes to resurrect her uncle, Count Dracula, where she can bring terror all across Europe. Our heroes this time are two characters, John Morris and Eric Lacard. If you're wondering just where the hell the Belmonts are, well, we're not going to find out until Castlevania Portrait of Ruin for the Nintendo DS, so until then, let's just say... Dracula finally returned the barbed lawnmower with the Belmonts giving no hard feelings afterwards. If you enter a specific code in the options menu, you can listen to a classic Castlevania tune when you're fully upgraded. Oh, damn it. Yeah, if you get hit just once, you lose the fourth upgrade. What is this, the Castlevania Adventure? No way, I didn't review that game yet. 
Unfortunately, if there's one thing John and Eric didn't learn from the Belmonts, particularly Simon from Super Castlevania 4, it was control. We're back to the original controls in this game, folks, so that means a stiff jump, no mid-air controls, and knockback. God! Taking a note from Super Mario Bros. 2 USA, Eric can do a super jump by holding down on the D-pad long enough. Because of this, Eric can take alternate paths that John himself can't get to. Whoa! Super jump indeed! Instead of just traveling through Transylvania, John and Eric have to travel all across Europe and stop whatever forces of darkness impede their path. It starts off familiar with you traveling through the destroyed remains of Castlevania, but then you're suddenly off to a shrine of Atlantis in Greece, then there's the Tower of Pisa in Italy, the Munitions Factory in Germany, a palace in France, and finally a castle in England. Damn, these guys really get around, and in such a short amount of time, I wonder just what the hell their method of travel is. Oh, uh, no, I was just asking. Die, zombie! Holy shit! Yep, if there's one thing Castlevania Bloodlines was not afraid to dwell on, it was the gore factor. Zombie guts splatter on the floor, harpies lose their heads upon death, and we have this rotting hellhound. God damn, that's gruesome! What was this game rated? GA General Audience? Damn, we were pretty hardcore in the 90s. Once again, if there's something that eases my frustration in a Castlevania game though, it's the music. It's definitely more upbeat and energetic than Super Castlevania 4, but to me, I think energetic music works best for Castlevania. I mean, I love Super Castlevania 4's atmospheric pieces, but this is music I could jam to all day. The Genesis style makes it feel a little aged though, and there are some times I can't help but feel the music and sound effects are belting or just busting out a wet fart. Sorry. Now, even though we stopped Elizabeth, Dracula manages to return anyway, and like Castlevania 3, he also has three forms. Luckily, the entire battle really isn't that hard, but the forms are just weird as fuck. His second form is this wizard thing, and his last form is this demon with a mouth for a crotch. Yeah, you might want to get that looked at. Resurrection of Dracula has been averted. Oh, wait, that's it? Huh, I thought it'd be more than that. Well, that was an easy paycheck. What kind of ending was that? Oh, come on, you have to complete expert mode just to see the real ending? I hate when games do that. I wonder what the easy ending looks like. Damn, we don't even see the castle crumble completely? What assholes? Wait, tomorrow is November 1st. You know what that means. Uncharted 3 is coming up tomorrow. The year is 1792. A dark priest known as Shaft has resurrected the evil count himself. Yes, the priest's name is Shaft, you dig? Dracula takes little to no time setting a plan into motion. Knowing damn well that a Belmont is surely on his way to wreck his shit up, and he is, his name is Richter, descendant of Simon Belmont. Some levels do have their moments though, like alternate stage 4, which is kind of annoying to complete with Richter because his horizontal whip can't do much against these tiny ass frogs. And if you don't have an appropriate sub weapon to deal with them, you're gonna be taking a fuckload of pot shots, which by the way, can also sport knockback at times. Oh for god's sakes! Unlike the other three maidens who really just serve as a means to get the completed ending, you can actually play as Maria when you rescue her. Playing as a 12 year old in a pink dress compared to the manliness that is Richter Belmont- Fuck you, Maria is awesome! She moves twice as fast as Richter, can attack twice as fast as Richter, as well as move and attack at the same time, she has a double jump which makes platforming almost a complete non-issue, two slide abilities which are great for getting around obstacles, and her sub-weapon animal buddies can fuck shit up! Can't handle a certain level with Richter? Reset the game, load up your save file, switch to Maria, and watch as she almost effortlessly deals with something a player in the hands of a Belmont could not. She's great for newbies, and a load of fun to play with when you just want to destroy everything in your way. She's a glass cannon though, so you can't be that reckless, otherwise you'll find yourself losing health extremely fast. I hope to Shaf I never have to encounter another Castlevania game as difficult as the third one. I get it. Classic Castlevania is supposed to be difficult, but that... That was trying just a little too hard. You know what also helps, and I think you guys know where I'm going at this point, the soundtrack. It's a Castlevania game, of course I'm going to bring up the music. The game utilizes Redbook audio thanks to CD-ROM technology, so we're talking high quality, blood pumping, toe tapping, upbeat 90s synthesized music here. Richter and Maria tell Dracula to go to hell, complete with the castle crumbling into nothingness. Oh, no, actually it doesn't collapse at all during Richter's ending. Huh. Beating the game with Maria causes the castle to collapse, but her ending is played for last more than anything, seeing as you beat the game with a 12 year old girl in a pink dress. Her credits theme is pretty catchy though, what the fuck?
Richter at times sounds like he's reading his lines after inhaling some helium. The name's Richter Belmont. Here. Take my hand. Everyone else does a pretty good job, including Dracula, who manages to pull off the whole Prince of Darkness thing rather well, with a bit of ham thrown in for good measure. We must prepare a proper welcome, Belmont. Exploring every nook and cranny in your pathway can also lead you to neat little collectibles like records that you can add to your music collection, or use to change the background theme of a specific stage to your liking. You can even unlock other games after finding them, like the PC Engine original like I mentioned earlier, Symphony of the Night, which I'll get into later, and whatever the hell this thing is. Apparently this is what you would get if you didn't have the necessary system card to play the original game on the PC Engine. Lasts all about two minutes with Opus 13 playing in the background. It's almost like a pirated version of Rondo of Blood you can only get in a shady flea market. Finally, rescuing all the girls gives Dracula a third transformation, which is hard as fuck. He's got attacks up the wazoo and a shitload of health. So I hope you know how to properly dodge everything he throws at you. This is going to be a long battle. I honestly just stick with Maria, if only because I love hearing Dracula comment on how you lost her little girl. Completely impossible! Beaten by a little girl?! Belmont's strut also doesn't translate well in 3D in my opinion. See this? Manly. See this? Stick up the ass. The English version of the original Rondo of Blood you can unlock also has some audio synchronization issues during cutscenes, leading to dialogue playing way ahead of when it's supposed to. Nothing major, but it is distracting at times. That just leaves this game, Castlevania Dracula X, released in 1995 for the Super Nintendo. Given how large Rondo of Blood was thanks to the CD format it was released on, cramming it all inside of a Super Nintendo cartridge was a technical impossibility. As a result, Castlevania Dracula X is almost a completely different game. The game is not horrible, it just has a lot of bullshit that makes it an overall inferior product. It's also expensive, and I'm not sure why. Maybe because it's rare? Something like that? I don't know. But thanks for the loan, Uncle. You saved me 130 bucks. For now. Who knows, I might just buy the damn game myself to complete the collection. <sighs> Help me. Castlevania Symphony of the Night. I love this game. Our story begins with a horribly inaccurate retelling of the final boss encounter with Richter and Count Dracula. This Richter is capable of dashing, super jumping, shoulder charging, ground sliding, he has fluid mid-air controls, and he can do that whip dangly thingy. His Hydro Storm item crash is now capable of destroying Dracula, both forms, in about 10 seconds flat. And if you still somehow manage to lose to Dracula with these upgrades, Maria jumps in, summons her animal buddies, and makes Richter completely invincible for the rest of the battle. No! This cannot be! That's how I easily destroyed Count Dracula once and for all. That's bullshit! While Alucard's all alone in his adventure, he does gain assistance in the form of familiars he can acquire after finding them. Most of them are pretty aggressive, attacking anything that's a threat within proper range, but some like the fairy are more of the supportive kind, healing Alucard when he's low on health assuming you have a spare potion in your inventory, or removing status conditions like petrification with a giant swing of a hammer. The second fairy you can get in the Saturn and PSP version of the game even sings you a song if you sit down in a chair long enough. Why? I... Don't know. It's odd that Alucard has to find this ability when he can do it naturally in Castlevania 3, but I guess sleeping for 300 years will make you forget, even though he's now vastly superior to what he was back then. Whatever. Really, the fact that the entire game takes place inside the castle doesn't mean shit in terms of aesthetical variation. This castle is a creature of chaos. It may take many incarnations. The main goal in Symphony of the Night is to find the cause of Castlevania returning prematurely and destroy it. But further exploration reveals that Richter Belmont has turned to the dark side and claims ownership of Castlevania itself. Maria insists that Richter must be under some sort of mind control and pleads Alucard to snap him out of it. There's nothing stopping you from heading straight to Richter and, um, kill him, but doing so will get you the bad ending. Searching in the right area with the appropriate upgrades will help you find the means to restore Richter back to normal, which includes a boss fight with Maria if you're playing the Saturn or PSP version of the game. You know, I understand she just wants to test me to make sure I'm capable of saving Richter, but this chick's out for fucking blood. Just when you think the game's over, this suddenly happens. Shaft summons a second castle, which is just like the original, only upside down! Oh no! I shit you not, there's a whole other castle to explore, and it's upside down. And for the love of God, do I get sick of the final Takata, which is the background theme that plays in no less than six areas of the inverted castle. By itself, it's a musical track that I think does a good job of conveying a sense of approaching danger, but when you hear it for the 68th time in a new area, you'd wish this game had the option for custom soundtracks. The first castle was jam-packed with a bunch of musical variety. Every area contained a unique piece of music that did a wonderful job in giving the specific area its own identity. 
In fact, despite the overuse of the final Takata in the inverted castle, I fucking love this soundtrack. Except for the credits theme, I don't quite understand what's going on there. There's more music in the inverted castle than the final Takata, and I love the likes of Lost Paintings, but you don't hear it nearly as often as you do than the final Takata. Just saying the name of the musical track makes me cringe a bit. At this point, if you're still unsure on why I absolutely cannot get enough of this game, then the next best thing I can tell you is to simply try the game for yourself. Oh, the PlayStation 1. You know what? Next time we meet, I'm gonna do something I've been meaning to do for a very long time. A console review! I mean, why not? This thing pretty much defined my gaming experiences from the mid to the late 90s. I'm gonna go work on that. You go play Symphony of the Night. But you probably won't listen to me anyway, will you?